Alright, so welcome to Caribbean Thoughts Lecture 5. Um, today we want to look at have we missed we want to discuss the issue of the issue of identity or heritage. Particularly the question, have we misunderstood our heritage? And we also want to quickly go back to tracing Caribbean history and roots. A discussion about an understanding of heritage must include an understanding, must include a trace of Caribbean history and our roots, especially with new research, which challenges the book Awax to Africans, which suggests that the, the people of the Caribbean today who came to replace um, the indigenous population have no connection or bearing, um, biological bearing, to those people, to the indigenous population. That is being questioned today, not only the Caribbean, but also here in the US. The ability to question what was thought to be something stems from critical thinking that we talked, we delved into a little bit last week. It was very important. The ability, to, okay, to, uh, to question, it comes from, it comes from, um, the practice of philosophy okay philosophy is the pursuit of truth um, and you have various branches of philosophy but it's from but critical thinking is important especially as um, and I said sometime later on you're going to hear me say and I think I said it last week, the post-colonial thinker must be a critical thinker the post-colonial thinker must be a critical thinker, especially when you understand the strategy that has gone into recreating this new world in the mold of a people that is foreign to it. Okay, so it is very so that so this so it's very important then that we begin to trace our Caribbean history and roots when we begin to think about Caribbean, because the post-colonial thinker is a critical thinker. Um, so we want to look, so we want to ask, so we, I've been kind of preparing you guys for the question anyway, but it's asking, um, have we misunderstood our heritage? Okay. So, and that's a very, that's a very, very important question. Um, so, so, but before we get into that, so I, well, we show you those questions, critical thinking, we looked at critical thinking last week. We defined critical thinking as thinking about thinking and evaluating current and past thoughts. Um, highlighting the importance of reflection. We did say that when you talk, okay, critical thinking is about reflection. And so at this level, there's a lot of critical thinking that takes place. That is what separates the collegiate, the college student from um, students who are not, or people who are not exposed to this level of education because we promote and we we, yeah, we promote um, critical thinking, which is reflective thinking. And to, okay, reflection involves revisiting certain positions or presuppositions. So that's, and John Dewey defines it as that. John, okay, who is said to be the father of reflective or critical thinking, but however he's not, because he quotes people like Bacon, okay? There are other people who have been doing reflective thinking or, or what I call iconoclastic thinking, image breakers or breaking the image. That comes from thinking deeply about things or philosophical thinking. So we talk about, uh, we, so the next thing we also emphasize the importance of, of deconstruction. De de uh, critical thinking emphasizes the deconstruction of reality and the pursuit of progress. So we emphasize the deconstruction of reality and the pursuit of progress. Because when you think critically, you're thinking, you're, the thinking is, to, is directed towards a particular goal. And we emphasize the deconstruction of reality, the deconstruction of philosophy and, and, and history. So in this class, we're deconstructing history, we're deconstructing philosophy. We, we mentioned, um, we discussed that briefly last week. We talked about Descartes and the existential dilemma. Descartes and his talk about existentialism, existence of talking about the self. Uh, 
but Descartes and the existential dilemma of his coming to terms with his own reality. And his own dilemma points to the need for, points to the importance of doing critical thinking as a post-colonial thinker. So we discussed Descartes and his famous quote, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Because he's trying to make sense of his own reality. And so he decides to stop. He decides to, 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 think, to, to think that he starts from ground zero. Nothing exists. Nothing is true. Let's begin with that. But it, to begin with that is to acknowledge that something is thinking to do that. So the only thing that he cannot, he cannot deny that there is a mind that thinks, okay? So, and when you start to think about objectivity and subjectivity, to be objective does not necessarily mean to be free of subjectivity or subjectivism. It also means to recognize that we are beset by subjectivism. And so therefore we have to be very loose and explorative in our objectivity as we approach life about anything. Um, we explain Descartes' exploration of existence and the role of the mind in affirming reality. And note that Descartes' proof of existence is limited to one's own reality. Yet there are those who have sought to create generalization or universalize certain truths or certain ideas and make it even normative as if this is the ideal. But then we talked about the issue that this, this, this human nature, this tendency that people have to privilege, okay, to privilege certain positions. But again, remember, so we, we looked at Descartes' proof of existence being limited to one's own mind, to one's own reality. And so therefore, if it is difficult to come to terms, um, to come to a conclusion without, without, um, without one's own mind or free from one's own thinking, the subjective, then we have to now question man's penchant, man's drive of universalizing their reality. Of course, somebody talk about the problem of culture and the problem of, we talk about the issue of the Caribbean, the Caribbean as a whole, but the Caribbean as, 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 as part of a whole. And in fact, even within the Caribbean, the islands, and even within the islands, you have the individual. So there is also this, the challenge of wanting to be part of the whole, but at the same time, wanting to be separate and wanting to be a human being with one's own drives and personalities and so on. Um, we talk about critical thinkers throughout history, mentioned in, um, the in critical thinkers like Michel Foucault, he, who is said to be a structuralist post, or postmodernist, well, sorry, postmodernist, although he, said, he would say that he's not necessarily a postmodernist, but he talks about how institutions are created in societies to continue a particular knowledge. Immanuel Kant talks about, um, Immanuel Kant says that history is a result of the varieties of human natures and circumstances. And of course, we talked about Karl Marx challenging Adam Smith's idea or, or, or theory or justification for the wealth of nations in capitalist societies or in wealthy societies, Karl Marx. So we talked that we briefly mentioned those thinkers are uh, as, as, they are, are very important to when we're discussing critical thinking. Um, we highlighted their challenges to existing knowledge and societal norms. We also talked about Emmanuel Gramsci, where he says, all men are philosophers. It's not excluded to just some. But there are those who devote themselves to the study of philosophy, and there are those who do not. Okay, Does that make those who devote themselves to philosophy act better thinkers than others? Well, then the question is, what is the basis that one is using to come to determination? What is the basis? It is a basis that, that caters to your position that would lead to a win. 
<laughs> don't ask me the question you want to ask when you engage people when you think so we discuss the impact of critical thinking on inventions innovation and societal progress i didn't we didn't do that part too much um post-colonial post-modern perspective um we explain how critical thinking emerges within the post-colonial and post-modern context and if you guys were listening and if you go back to watch it was a three-hour video i actually watched it it was deep um, I left the class last week saying, what did I talk about? <laughs> but then when I watched it and several other persons, it was really deep. It covered a lot. And I hope you guys get a chance to really go back and watch the videos because they're deep. But um, we post um, critical thinking emerges within. It does. Well, it it emerges within the post-colonial and post-modern context. We talk about the 1930s. And I'm going to reference the 1930s. The 1930s was pretty revolutionary in the Caribbean. I mean, there's labor union, the labor unions were rising. Um, I mean, it was a very depressed time in society. Um, we talk about the New Deal in the US um, that started the development of social welfare. And um, at social, we won't get into social welfare, but in, in the book that I'm writing, I make a comparison between social welfare in Jamaica and social welfare in the post-industrial country, the US. Um, we won't get into it in this class. We won't have time for that. But I would love, it would be great for you guys to get an opportunity to read that. But, um, and I wrote a paper on that, Come, looking at social welfare. And it's and really in the 1930s. Social welfare is the way before the 1930s. But in the, the way we think about it in a very scientific way, um, it really started between the 1930s and 40s. Um, the rise of labor unions, the, the, the thinking, um, this movement was independent. But by the time we get to the 1940s in the, in the Caribbean, there was people were thinking about the federation. In the 1930s, they were thinking about independence. But by, by the 1940s, they were thinking about no, they were thinking about the federation in the 1930s, 40s. Um, by, by, for the early 1940s, we pushed late toward the 1940s into the 50s. Then they started talking about going it alone, independent sort of, and in, instead of talking about independent Caribbean, they were talking about independence. I don't know how that came to be, but I thought that is what has helped to dog Caribbean. They needed a kind of unity to mitigate against what was coming. But little did they know what was coming because we were too insulated or insular or focused on a kind of nationalist, populist independence without thinking about planning for the future, okay? So why we were, okay, but we talked about the issue, critical thinking emerges within the post-colonial and post-modern context. Um, this, and we discussed the question of dominant narratives and challenging institutionalism. Briefly, Homi Baba talks about the, um, the periphery and the center. But um, we didn't do much of this, so we'll talk about that later on. Um, we haven't mentioned, we didn't, we, we briefly talked about Franz Fanon, Homi Baba, and VS Nepal as examples, but we will, there is one class that we will get into where we, when we talk about, we're going to be talking about Franz Fanon, Homi Baba, VS Nepal. There's one class that is tailored just to talk about the Negro is not any more than the white man. And wherever um, um, and, and and the colonial the colonial subject is a political creature in the global sense of the term that Frank Fanon in black skin white mask and wretched of the earth respectively and of course Homi Baba does Hom Homi Baba and I think was it Richard Philcox who 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 helped to translate and and create and um, who tra and 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 uh, provided commentary on Frank Fanon and in such a unique unique and in an amazing way, um, in the book Wretched of the Earth. But then Homi Baba went on to, um, goes on to talk about um, Franz Fanon and V.S. Nepal and other Caribbean literature and the post-colonial in a unique way. And in her book, in his book, The Location of Culture, um, a, very, a, a very important work. And of course, V.S. Nepal um, is a very important Caribbean Literary and or writer that we have, we will discuss. We will discuss in one just one class. We will spend the time to look at them. But um, uh, last week we looked at well, analyzing. We said that critical thinking involves analyzing and evaluating ideas and thought. Um, and we said that critical thinking. We we describe critical thinking as a metaphysical and analytical process. And we talk about metaphysics is to 
is what uh, metaphysics, of course, is a branch of philosophy that asks what is ultimately real about reality. In other words, okay, so you are going deeper and deeper. You're cutting. You're looking at the component parts of things. Um, it involved, we explain it in terms of dissecting and exploring thoughts, patterns, and actions. Um, the imp and um, I, would, I don't think we highlight the use of logic, common sense, reason, and expansive thought. We won't get into that, the issue of, but part of critical thinking is logic because critical thinking involves um, uh, philosophical exploration. And when we talk about the issue of logic, logic, you have inductive reason and you have deductive reasoning. Um, we talk Caribbean thought, thinking involves reasoning. There is no reason. You thinking that there is no reason without thinking and there is no thinking without reason. Okay, so logic is very important um, to, the, to the concept of Caribbean thought or critical thinking, sorry. Um, we also looked at the issue of being fair, open, and in one sense, we are biased, but in another sense, we are not. People, if you, the post, we said that the post-colonialist is, is, post is a skeptic. He's suspicious of knowledge. He's suspicious of historical truths. Because it is that history that has come to, to create the Caribbean position. Um, so, of course, we have to be fair. We have to be open. But I said the post-colonial thinker is, is a skeptic. Um, but and there, but we but the thing is, you the post-colonial thinker have to acknowledge personal biases. We have to. They, we talked about critical thinking involved the importance of having trained ears, eyes that see beyond the obvious, seeing beyond the obvious. And we also mentioned the need to examine and evaluate different perspectives without taking sides. But in a sense, that's going to be hard to do. How can you do that without taking sides? because human nature are bent in those ways, taking sides. So how do we do that? Say, for example, Caribbean thought, we're taking Caribbean side, in a sense. Um, so how do you mitigate against that? Of course, again, it begins with acknowledging one's skepticism. And we're going to play our tape in a, in a few minutes. So you will, we'll, we'll talk about the subaltern, because we mentioned critical thinking in, within Caribbean thought and the, the the idea of the subaltern. We're going to play a 12 minutes video. It's a lecture as well, but from somebody else. But I thought it was very important that they talked about CLR James and the Black Jacobins. And of course, there's another one that I want to present to you today. Hopefully, we have time. Okay. Um, developing critical thinking. Critical thinking is developed over time through training and exploration. And um, we talked about last week, last week in terms of critical thinking, I talked about how it started. Um, the, 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 the academy or the educational school, um, it becoming a discipline so that they can train. You know, I said to people, part of the problem we have in society today is because many people lack the skill to think critically. And I say, say for example, there, there is this big debate in the US about gun laws. And that, um, gun laws, whether or not guns everybody should have the right to bear arms and so on and so forth. And I said to people, look at the Caribbean, look at Jamaica. Jamaica and many countries in the Caribbean have the most restrictive gun laws, gun policy. Nobody have the right to bear arms in Jamaica. No one. Okay? It's very difficult. It's not a right to bear arm. okay, in Jamaica or the Caribbean. If you study the Caribbean and look at their laws towards uh, their law, um, their laws towards bearing arms. It is restrictive. Unlike the U.S., everybody have the right to bear arms, um, and so they are make they try they want to make it more restrictive, especially the kind of high powered weapons that people have. But I said to people, okay, fine, look at Jamaica. Jamaica has a restrictive policy in terms of the right to bear arms and so on, and access to guns. Yet, Jamaica has one of the Jamaica has one of the highest um, crime rates in the world. Trinidad, their crime and crime gun well, it's not as high, but it's getting it's well, actually it has it has become a problem for Trinidad today. Barbados, not so much. Definitely Guyana and Haiti. Okay, 
They, so, so, uh, so this, when you look at the Caribbean and the, the, the gun policies that we have in the Caribbean, it is very restrictive, yet crime and violence is high. So I said to people, it does, okay, in fact, what has happened in the Caribbean and particularly Jamaica and Haiti and part of Trinidad and Guyana is that they have uh, an underground or what is known as a black market. So usually when, when governments or societies try to limit access to something, what happens is that there's always this reaction. There's always uh, an, an, an underground economy or a black market, as they call it, black market, okay, that operates outside of the systems. So, in, so what, what people do is that they become very creative, okay? That's, and in fact, that's why they have this, the argument about criminal, criminalizing black people because of, because of the kind of criminalizing black people because black people do certain things, perform certain activities that they have criminalized. Um, what am I getting at? I won't get into it yet. But we talk about guns. So gun, the gun policy is restrictive. Nobody has the right to be a gun in the Caribbean, yet it had, it's, it, the Jamaican and the Caribbean have the highest crime rates. Of course, it could be an issue of what we call relative deprivation. Relative deprivation. Where this is not the time to talk about relative deprivation. It is something that we will talk about later in the class if we have time. But of course, it is something that you have to talk about in Caribbean thought, the issue of relative deprivation, especially in Jamaica and in various parts of the Caribbean, and especially in black and brown, black and brown countries or countries where you have a higher concentration of black and brown people. Crime and violence is high. But there is also what's also high? Poverty and income inequality compared to other parts of the world where you have more white people. And I'm not being racist, it's just the truth. It's, that's from study. And it's, that's not from anecdotal evidence. Okay, study, it's just from, it's from it's actual study that has, and, uh, that has been conducted. When you actually look, and if you yourself were to look at, do a study of all black countries, black and brown countries, and study their crime rate, study their corruption, and we're gonna talk about corruption later in the class. Or if you want to jump ahead, there is a lecture on corruption that talks about the corruption index. And the NIA have a video, has a video, but it's dated. But there are there, but but I have written something new about that, the corruption index of the Caribbean. Not um, I think there are one or two Caribbean countries where the corruption index is not that bad, but the majority of the Caribbean islands. But when you go to Haiti and Guyana, it's even worse. Okay, but the issue I'm raising here as it relates to, I said I'm talking, I'm emphasizing an idea from Caribbean thinking based in critical thinking. And the point I'm making is when you look at the Caribbean, well, sorry, if you were to look at the idea of relative deprivation, relative deprivation, which is a, which is a Marxist materialist theory, a Marxist materialist theory that says societies that have high that have high um, income inequality or where there's income inequality and poverty will also have high levels of crime and violence, okay? This is, that is not a new theory. That's not a new, it's not a new theory, okay? It's something that has been around, I mean, it is a theory that has been around for a very long time. Of course, we said it's a Marxist materialist theory. Um, and so when you, if you were to, so if, so part of the discussion that we need to have when you look at how do you mitigate or mini mitigate crime and violence in countries like Jamaica and the Caribbean or in communities, black communities in the post-industrial communities or in, or in Caribbean diaspora communities in the post-industrial society, they have also have high crime and violence. How do you, how do you mitigate against that? Okay, because let, if you were, if we are to think about restricting gun violence, that, sorry, restricting um, people's ability to bear arms. That hasn't helped, really. It creates more problems, okay? But there, so that is why it's very important to, to do a study and to think expansively about things and clearly about things. So there is another study that talks about income inequality. Fine, what's the income inequality and what's income inequality and poverty in Jamaica? Of course, my first book, which is the textbook for this class, Nearly Boilism, looks at income inequality and poverty. And one of the things we talk about is that um, income in, 
income inequality and poverty mirrors GDP growth in Jamaica. Okay, there has it's never been steady. It was high in the 50s, GDP was above 4%. Was that about what? I think it was 5 point something percent. We have never had that in the Caribbean. Well, well not, I mean, particularly Jamaica um, has not, hasn't, haven't had that, despite the fact that we've had resources. Uh, but the point I'm making is that, so income inequality and poverty, po um, income inequality um, has, has, comp has risen in Jamaica. It was um, an income, in we won't talk about income inequality right now, but income inequality um, looks at consumption and household consumption. That's how it's measured. And I talk at length about income inequality and how you measure income inequality. Um, you have perfect equality and you have income inequality. And I think Jamaica's figure was was very high, but th over. The, but if you look at global income inequality, it's rising, but it's not as high in certain countries, depending on the racial or demographical makeup of those countries. But in the, in the Caribbean, compared to other parts of the world, income inequality is high. Okay, um, not just not doing income inequality, but sorry, it's rising at an alarming rate. But not just that, but there's also the issue of poverty and abject poverty, which at one time it was at. I think a couple of years ago, when I interviewed um, Shelley and Fraser, at, um, who is the executive director for the Herschel Foundation, um, her study suggests poverty at 21%. Mine wasn't that as high, it was 75% there above. But especially with during COVID and beyond that, poverty was on the rise in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Um, however, we were hearing that crime and violence was, um, the government was doing as much as they possibly can to, to, to address crime and violence. But the addressing of the crime and violence is a, they're making it into a police issue, a security issue. When, when crime and violence sometimes not necessarily a police issue, okay, or a security issue. It could, it's an economic issue. Deal with the economics, or it could be an issue of ethics, okay, um, and socialization and so on and so forth. But we live in a society that's very myopic. And so when we think about fixing issues, it begins to first thinking critically about things, okay? And then seeking to apply the fix. But uh, we talked about, uh, so we're looking at the post-colonial man as a critical thinker, the need for post-colonial individuals to engage in critical thinking, highlights skepticism towards history and its creation of the present, okay? Um, of course, we mentioned Karl Marx again. And the post-colonial thinker being, uh, a skeptic is important because of how the Caribbean came to be and who we are as, as people in the Caribbean. Okay. Um, what the strategy that has gone into recreating the new world and making Caribbean, the Caribbean, Caribbean as a place and the people within it second class or third world, or we call it, there was usually Caribbean people um, are, or Caribbean places were referred to as third world. Or, or, or developing or say, but it was always this, and I think it was Alice that talks about the issue of the using the word tribe to describe Africans. But the, the words are very, terms are important. And when you start to study terms and you get to understand why we have to be critical thinkers. So for example, okay, there are the, uh, in terms of discoveries that's accredited to people from of African descent were never given to him or her, it was accorded to the European because the Negro was said to be less than, okay, or what um, CLR dreams, not CLR dreams, um, um, what Homi Baba said of, of, of refer to um, V.S. Nepal in one of the books that he wrote, that nothing great ever come from the Caribbean or the black man. So therefore then you have to reconsider, you have to, you have to, Say, for example, we talk about the misclassification of, of the African. Now they are saying that many Africans have ties to the ancient people. It is said that Christopher Columbus discovered Jamaica and the Caribbean and the Americas. But did he? There were other peoples here before. There, the post-colonial must be a thinker, but because 
there was always this drive to redefine him, to bring him down to size, so to speak. So therefore, it's very important for the post-colonial to be a critical thinker. So critical thinking is, trans is transformative and it is revolutionary and it is very important to the practice of Caribbean thought. Okay, so that's for last week. I won't, this is part two. I won't do the Negro is not. Why, am I, why is this important? Um, I, I have here on the slide, to start a new anything requires a journey in a past. To start a new Anything, to start anew, anything requires a journey in a past that begins to tell our story. That begins to tell our story. That's very important, especially I write in the epilogue of this new book, reimagining peoples within critical race theory, moving from a victim approach to a hero approach. Dana Berry, in, Dana Berry is one of those persons who is writing to reimagine the African or the Caribbean, looking at his resistance, looking at the black man in terms of the value and his resistance that speaking to his intelligence. But we won't get to this. But, but what I will talk, what, what I would want, what, what is important is the fact that Fanon says that the Negro is not any more than the white man. And I begin this particular exploration by saying to start a new, to start anything new, anything requires a journey in a past that begins to tell our own story. Our own story. And so, and it's important because, and why this is important, fine, since I'm here, Frank Fanon again says the Negro is not any more than the white man. The Negro is not any more than the white man in black skin, white masks. And in a sense, he's doing psychoanalysis of the colonized, the systematically controlled man or woman. He's doing psychoana psychoanalysis in the sense that he's removing the dominant view. He is, he is creating an empowered self, much like Sigmund Freud, but he combs colonialism with the empowered self. He removes the dominant view of comparisons, striving for the empowered self. Because let me tell you, when I read this book and when I saw this statement, the Negro is not, by the way, so this is wrong. It should be the Negro is not full stop any more than the white man. That's how he wrote it. You don't write, you know, when you compare things, you don't compare things like that. You normally compare things with something else. That cup is bigger than the other. But he does not do that. He would say that cup, full stop, is, well, maybe he would say that cup is, that cup is, or oh, that cup is big, bigger, full stop, the other cup. That's how he would, that's how he would approach it. That's his psychoanalysis. He does not, he refrains he doesn't, he doesn't believe in comparing things based on the dominant view. Because when you start to compare one thing in relation to another, then it places a certain value on one thing in relation to the next. So he removes the dominant view within comparison, striving for empowered self. And according to Omi Baba here, the familiar al alignment of colonial controlled subjects is disturbed by a break. So in a sense, this is his resistance. This is his violence. A pause from the usual way to reveal a truly authentic self. And that's what ba Baba said of, 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 of Franz Fanon as it relates to this particular statement, the Negro is not a full stop any more than the white man. And I, I am saying that this was his violence. This was his resistance. And somebody wrote that I advocate for violence some time ago, and I said, I do not advocate for violence, okay? 
but I advocate, yes, I do advocate for violence, but not physical violence. Yes, not physical violence, but a kind of violence that breaks from the norm. So it could be when, when Homi Baba talks about the center and the periphery and her, her, her affinity for, the, for things that are off center. That's her violence. When Frantz Fanon writes in a way that does not subscribe to the English language, breaking up one sentence into two, that's his violence. Not subs okay. When Louise Bennett, okay, in um use the in sorry, the 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 patois, the Jamaican vernacular, the patois in in her formal writings and um her formal speeches and so on. That was her violence because usually you don't speak patois um, formally. Okay? You're supposed to speak that in certain registers. Talk about the issue of registers. But she knows she went beyond that and she spoke it in formal functions and she spoke it at informal functions. That was her violence. That was her resistance. I write that when we hear of Jamaica and the Caribbean, we think of beautiful islands of paradise with sun and sea and sand and reggae music and cannabis and Arab people like Usain Bolt who are living out their best dreams, desires and lives. But neoliberalism analyzes the motif and motif is the foregoing idea given the historical and current economic and political situation in Jamaica and the Caribbean and the global south in an attempt to escape the adverse realities of poverty, inequality, and injustice, the people of the global south find themselves in North metropolises with very little agency and minimal change to their lives. In fact, except for the use of cleaning neoliberal waste, oh, that's a, listen to this. Let me say that again. This is, this is deep. In an attempt, in an attempt, to escape the adverse realities of poverty, inequality, and injustice, the people of the Caribbean, or of the global south, of which the Caribbean is a part, find themselves in north metropolises. In other words, those people who have left the global south to the global north, or they are out outward looking, or upward looking. But, and I say to you, Frantz Fanon write that the that the global man in Wretched of the Earth, that the, that, the, that the colonial man is a global, is a political creature. A political creature, he's a creature, meaning he is created. The colonial man is a created being of the Caribbean. The colonial man is created. That's what, um, that's what Frantz Fanon said in his book, Wretched of the Earth. Writes that the colonized man is a political creature in every sense of the earth, meaning that he is still a wretched of the earth whose experience of ambivalence tends to a negative experience of contrast. Negative experience of contrast. Again, Fanon had written in Wretched of the Earth that the colonized man is a political creature in every sense of the term. But today, the, the post-colonial man is still wretched of the earth, whose experience of ambivalence tends to a negative experience of contrast. What am I talking about? Listen to the statement, what I said here, which is in the book. This is, this is very deep. I said, when we hear of Jamaica and the Caribbean, we think of beautiful islands of paradise with sun, sea, sand, reggae music, cannabis, and iry people like Usain Bolt, people who are living out their best dreams, desires, and lives. The most time I've heard, what are you doing here? Jamaica is amazing. What are you doing here? Of course, Jamaica is amazing. But the book, so I said, read the book. It will tell you how I'm here. But book analyzes this motif, this this motif, motif M O I M O T I F, this prevailing idea. The book, this prevailing idea, 
given the historical, historical and current economic and political situation in Jamaica and the Caribbean and the global south. Because the Caribbean, the global south, we are all connected. Our experiences are connected. We are all coming out of a post-colonial experience and we still experience the negative, we are still experiencing the negative part of, of that post-colonialism. Follow me, this is important. When we think of Jamaica, we think of island paradises or, okay, people are living out their best dreams, but Mali and so on and so forth. But then I said, the book questions that motif because in an attempt to escape the adverse realities of poverty, inequality, and injustice, I mean, there is no injustice in the Caribbean. There's no problem. Of course, there's poverty in the Caribbean compared to everywhere else. Of course, there's income inequality. Okay. We talk about the six richest families in the Caribbean, uh, the families that are the wealthiest and so on. Anyway, we won't get we won't get into that right now. But the people of the global south find themselves in so okay. If the if the if it was such a bed of rose in the Caribbean, why is it that we have one of the challenges of the Caribbean is brain drain? Or why is it that it is so, why is it that immigration policy towards people of the Caribbean is so restrictive? Because they are, they are just like the people in Mexico and like, and they are, they are, they are going to, to places and the ish, immigration is a big issue today. Anytime there's an election in the US, their immigration becomes a very important issue. Immigration becomes a very important issue. But immigration cannot be, you cannot discuss the issue of immigration outside of a history of lack, a strategic history that has created a Caribbean or a black and brown position that has made them so, made them always traveling, always ambivalent. And I said to people, when people got independence, it was an independence that benefited the people who wanted to give it. Okay? Because slavery and so on and, and colonialism was after a while colonialism, colonialism became outdated. People found other ways to control and to make money without having slaves. In fact, you made these people into, into into certain kind in, into people who can spend, give them a little bit, give them some pittance, then they pay you. <laughs> but anyway, but anyways, in an attempt to escape the adverse realities of poverty, inequality, and justice, the people of the global south find themselves in north metropolises with very so okay, fine. It's island paradise, but they're they're going but they're going in droves to the north or they want to get there. They do whatever they can to get there if they have to. But when they get there, what do they find? Uh, when they get there, when they get here, what do they find? The immigrant. This is what they find in an attempt to escape. They're escaped. Wait, hold on. In an attempt to escape the adverse realities, how are they escaping the adverse realities in paradise? That's why I'm telling you the book quest challenges the motif in an attempt to escape the adverse realities of poverty, inequality, and the um, and injustice. The people of the global south, the people of the global south of the Caribbean, find themselves in North metropolises with very little agency. And of course, I'm being probably a little bit general here as if all Jamaicans and all people of the Caribbean are breaking themselves to leave. But I said to you, they're not necessarily breaking themselves to leave. But when I talk about, it's not necessarily the outward, the externality of the Caribbean, okay? The externality and our openness, the fact that we are so open to penetration. And I said to you, when you start to study power and control, you have to study the issue of penetration. And one of the things and when you start to study, uh, Alisa asked me, oh, my God, Ronaldo, that is loaded. Life is about people and how we re and how we relate. But life is what you make it or allow others to make of it for you. And then we start talk about the issue of power and, the, and, and life is about people and how people relate. We talk about human dynamics. Part of studying the Caribbean, what is the Caribbean place in the world? 
the Caribbean people in the world. In, in other words, you're looking at the dynamics of humanity, the dynamics that exist in society today. Okay, the dynamic that exists today stems from something in the past, which continues to strategies today. And the issue of penetration is important because how open you are will determine the ability that people have to penetrate, to impose, and to flood your, your country with goods and services without anything that you can do. They, okay? In an attempt to, ask, to escape the adverse realities of poverty, inequality, injustice, the people of the global south find themselves in the north metropolises with very little, very little agency and minimal change to their life because people travel for why people travel people are looking people travel looking for opportunities people travel okay um looking for change yes and i have said in the last class or in a particular class one of these classes we had talking about what existed in the americas in the americas the taino people were people who traveled all along the coast of the americas the people before 14 the, before the 1400s or 1492 before christopher columbus came to the caribbean Okay, they are the Americas. There was travel. Travel was a, a part of, of the Americas. And they would travel whenever the seasons or the climate change, or when or okay, or if there was or, or if of or if they had utilized all the resources and and okay, then they'll have to go somewhere else. And the thing is, nobody cornered off anything. There was no fencing, so you could just go from place to place within your group. The only fence that exists it was within your group. But when the Europeans came and okay and took colonialism to the next level then that all changed in an attempt to escape the adverse realities of poverty inequality and injustice the people of the global south find themselves where in the north in the global north in the post-industrial in the developed notice we don't use the word third world okay that's backward it suggests that we are third and we are not Language is important, and we are all about what? Reimagining peoples within critical race theory. Not thinking race, but moving away from a victim approach to a hero approach. So therefore, we won't use derogatory terms that define us as second. So let me continue, but this is very important. So they travel, and they find what? Very little agency and minimal change to their lives. In fact, now this is powerful. In fact, this is from the book Neoliberalism. In fact, except for the use of cleaning neoliberal waste, the immigrant is usually portrayed as what? As an alien with three heads and big sharp teeth, seeking to steal and destroy the profit and disrupt society. Why, why I mean, I, I wrote this, you know something was happening in the US when I wrote this. And I can, okay, I was, I, I was, um, I, I was, uh, I used to work for a child, youth and family services agency in, in Philadelphia. It takes a village. And part of my job, I was a family group decision making facilitator and coordinator. It's a new model in dealing with, um, dealing with the number of people who are in aggregate care. Aggregate care means group homes. Especially in Philadelphia, aggregate care um, surpasses that of the national average. I think they were aiming for what, 12.5% or something of the sort. And at that time, it was in Philadelphia, it was way beyond that. It was probably almost in the 20% or 21, 22%. We were trying to get it back down. So we were thinking, so we started what is known as Family Group Decision Making Conference, which is something that I really want. And because I'm so busy, I'm doing so many different things, I can't really spend time to really sit down with JTS and the Dean and probably speak with Jamaica about incorporating this particular model in how we practice. And it's a model within, the, within black and brown communities. It really works in those communities because within black and brown communities, we, we, we am the kind of family we promote. We, of course, the, the community is what raised the kid. It was, was always part of the issue. Okay, the, the, the extended family is important. The pastor is important, okay? Um, the uncle is important. The big brother, the sister, the cousin, 
um, the OG, whatever, and so forth. The community is what ra will raise it, especially with the problem of, of fatherhood. Okay, and even now, it's not just fatherhood, but motherhood and fatherhood is a premium in black and brown communities. Okay, so it's so now what we, we created a, a, a family group decision making program or model. And part of that model was to bring the family together, to empower them, to identify the problem and to sit them down at the table and have them come up with the plan. They come up with a plan. In a, in, and it, it covers a lot, it meets a lot of needs because my job was to expose them to planning, okay, and also to connect them with resources in their communities and give them the tools to plan. And I was to facilitate the plan, but they are actually leading the plan. And they come up with the goals, the tasks, the timeline, and who is responsible. And then we sign off on the plan and it goes to the judge who, and, every, and okay, and we try to have a buy-in from everybody. That was really, and, and, and I think that is something I would want, I, I'm going to definitely recommend you guys to consider in your own, if you go, if you're doing social work, even as a pastor, as something that you could do. But FGDM is very good. Um, and I did that. But the point I'm making here is we find ourselves, I, when I wrote this, I was doing a conference. I was facilitating a conference for a family whose ch children were being who was part of the program, the CYS, um, we had um, taken the kids away or the kids were on the verge of being taken away temporarily, placed them into DHS care and then identify the problem and then come up with a solution to, to that speaks to the problem involving the community and the family. Because the goal is not to keep the kids. The goal is always for the kids to be in a place, but a place that was safe. So we talk, one of the things we talk about in child youth, and, child youth and family is risk factors. What are the, okay, we want to ensure that there is no, that there aren't any risk factors in the home or within the community, okay? So we have to ensure that the risk factors, um, risk, so we have to do what is known as a risk assessment and so on and so forth. And so therefore the, com the family comes together and we do that. And that's very powerful and important. So anyways, the I had a meeting with them and we facilitated a meeting. One person said to me, you're not even from here. No, the person said, the, the, they come up with a plan and the plan was for the child, for, for another young person in the family, for another family member who was about, but the family member was underage. That family member, to, the family member wanted to keep the child, the children. And I said, no, that can't be a plan. Um, I won't approve the plan. I mean, first of all, the Department of Human Services won't approve that plan. Okay, we can't put the kids in your care because you are on the age one and so forth. So um, she started to attack me. How I'm, I'm not American. How I get this job. <laughs> and I, and you know, I was writing this book at that time. Okay. And of course, I wrote the book over seven years because it was and it was also part of my thesis but and i said the immigrant is seen um very little agency minimal change to the in fact except for the they find themselves in north met metropolises with very little agency and minimal change to their lives in fact except for the use of cleaning neoliberal waste the immigrant is usually portrayed as an alien with three heads and big sharp teeth. It's either they are good, it's either, this is the argument in immigration here in the US sometimes or in post-industrial country. For those people who are defending immigration, they are great to work, to pop up the country. Yes? They are great cleaners and domesticated workers. Yes? Um, which, so I use the word, in, okay? They make good helpers and so on and so forth. And of course, many Jamaicans don't have a problem coming here to do that. Um, but many people from the black country, when they come to these countries, it is as if they are seen as being good for certain things and they justify and champion the immigrant for certain things. Cleaning neoliberal waste. Outside of that, on the negative side, they, for those who are against 
people from the global south um um becoming normalized persons in this country the argument is that they are aliens big sharp teeth they're criminal drug dealers so on and so forth um the um they, they are a a a a a a burden on the US economy. So, so I said, in fact, except for the use of cleaning nearly boy waste, the immigrant is usually portrayed as an alien with three heads and big sharp teeth seeking to do what? What is the immigrant from the global cell trying to do? To steal and to destroy the profit and to disrupt society. As and so I say, as such, we will discuss Black, Brown, and Pan-African struggles for economic prosperity, justice, and freedom, and to consider e their e uh, efforts, abilities, or inabilities to chart their own futures since decolonization and realize real, notice I use the word real, real, real political independence and economic prosperity. And I say, perhaps they are charting their own course by the few corrupt, and I said to you, we're going to be looking at corruption, okay? Corruption is high in the Caribbean, especially in black and brown countries, African countries, corruption is high. Is it, okay, as a response to the issues in the, of what we are we're lifting up, inequality and poverty? I said, perhaps they are charting their own course by the few corrupt of the status quo who are benefiting from international partnerships with the neoliberal regime of the Washington Consensus, advocates for the bureaucratic phenomenon. Because part of the bureaucratic phenomenon, bureau, when we talk about bureaucratic, bureaucratic, what is bureaucratic? Talk about the, bureau, the bureaucracy. Some, we talk about something large and heavy-handed. Rules and regulations red tapes and systems and so on and so forth. And yes, but sometimes bureaucracy is, is, a, is a strategy to conceal those who are trying to benefit or to gain benefits at the expense of others. But we talk about bureaucracy and we talk about the Pharisee or Pharisee collision. Do as I say, but not as I do. Talk about the bureaucratic phenomenon. Do as I say, but not as I do. The bureaucratic phenomenon where in the 19th with the WTO and the IMF and the IMDB and this move towards developing a global world in the 1970s and 80s and the 90s. And, okay, and countries had to sign to international agreements. The agreement I call it bureaucratic because and far, full of far sea collision because the Caribbean had to sign over their soul. But the people in the global north, they weren't doing it. And that is why they were able to penetrate the Caribbean because of this bureaucratic phenomenon where the Caribbean, after they got independence, they signed, okay, and in the 1960s, they were met with the, the oil crisis, the, the OPEC oil crisis, and they need money. And they went to the international, um, they went to the international, um, um, the post-industrial countries who had created um, lending agencies, and they know what they were doing. They, they created these lending agencies way ahead of the oil crisis. <laughs> Anyways, they created these le lending agencies as if they knew that what was coming, but the Caribbean people didn't know. But anyways, created these lending agencies and these double organizations, okay, and said, okay, we are living in a global village. You can't subsidize, okay? You can't have tariff. You have to liberalize your exchange rates, so on and so forth. But they weren't doing that. So they created rules, okay, but that they didn't follow but we were following it. And then I talk about the issue of our theology, the theology that we inherited. Yes, the religion that whether or not theology inherited ideas of the world and our religion kept us down because they were doing something that we weren't doing. They were, they were doing something that they, well, they weren't doing something that we were doing. And so I and so one of the things I talk about, say for example, casino gambling, um, and how the church in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, and other and some other part of the Caribbean, um, they were opposed to 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 um, casino gambling 
because of their because of an inherited theology okay and whether or not that helped to keep us back in terms of the gains that we can gain from certain economic arrangements but those are some of the discussions you, you will then proceed to have when you start to think in these ways the, the policy decisions that we have in the caribbean okay it's very important um so that's for last week's class that i just did every now we're going to get into tracing and defining Caribbean. But before I do that, um, the question for the day is, have we misunderstood our heritage? Have we misunderstood our heritage? I want to, we're going to get into that question. And so it begins by us in 1492, when we have to do a trace of the Caribbean. And by the way, where do we begin? When you, when, where do we begin the study of the Caribbean? We begin in 1492, when Christopher Columbus was said to have discovered Jamaica, sorry, and the Caribbean and, and the Americas. But why did he come to the Caribbean? When you read Arawaks to Africans and other European books dealing with the issue, Christopher Columbus came to the Caribbean and he came to bring religion in a sense. It was an evangelistic mission It was a what? An evangelistic mission. It was. Sorry. When? Yes. Sorry about interrupting, but wasn't that other primary school text state that um that he ended up in the Caribbean by mistake and he was searching for gold for um East Asia somewhere there? Yes, yes. That's the yes. Of course, he said they said that he came. He was looking. He came. He, he ended. He came here by mistake. It was an error. But it doesn't matter. Um, he was traveling wherever he's going. He's going, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. So stick a pin on that because if you look at if you're looking at my the, if you look at the um, PowerPoint, you see ulterior motive. You have motive and you have ulterior motive. Yes, you have motive. You have ulterior motive. He was looking for gold. Yes. But and for profit and for but also to satisfy a greed. And because of the international competition. By that time, people they were racing all over the world, the European countries, trying to, to find out which monarch is the wealthiest, because they're all they're all related in Europe. They are all related, they're princes, cousins, whatever the case is. But they are competing against each other. And they want to be the wealthiest. But they also said, when Christopher, if you read the books, um, they also said that Christopher Columbus was also and was also going to Christianize the new world. Because yes, his first visit, looking for gold, he was doing a conquest, looking for gold and so on and so forth, but also trying to find trading routes and so on and so forth. But the first time they went, they, they said they were went looking for gold and and so on and so forth, and spices and all of that. But then they went back after that, saying that they're going to Christianize the new world. They were going to do what? They were going to bring knowledge. They were going to bring religion. Yes? Techniques and so on and so forth. And that these people were devils and demons and brothers of Satan. And so, in, so of course, so... So he came here in the 1492 for, okay, in 1492. And then he came back in 1492, um, between 1492, 1493, 94. Now. So they came back, he keep coming back to the Caribbean and then had set and found a post and settled in the Caribbean. But please remember that, remember they, these people, the Europeans were, religion was the order of the day. Okay. Not science, religion. Everything rotated around religion. And so therefore, as they embarked on this new found exploration, Christopher Columbus is also saying that I'm going to Christianize these new peoples and new places. I'm gonna, we're gonna carry religion as if these people don't have culture, they don't have religion, they don't have tongue, they don't have their own ways. So he is going to, so in a so it's all it has always been about imposing one valley on the other. They are going to this country to impose themselves because what they have is not better than what we have. But also, they are going not only to not 
only for that, but also to protect their interests. The, ul the ulterior motive was gold, profit, and to satisfy the greed and strategic positioning. Strategic positioning. Okay. In fact, it, when Christopher Columbus came to the came to Jamaica in the New World and and settled briefly, the pop and um, part of the question that we must ask ourselves is. How did he treat these people? Did he have African slaves? There was no, no, there, there was no exploration to Africa. Okay, so the people who he enslaved were the people, were the locals in the Caribbean, the Amer, the Amer, the the um the Amerindians, the Taino people. Okay, that's the people who were who they had dominated at first and intermingled with. But by the time, but and the own and the Spanish kept the Spanish kept Jamaica and many of their outposts as a strategic positioning to America, but they didn't think of Jamaica and parts of the Caribbean as important because there was no gold. Okay, so while some Europeans settled there and so on and so forth, but while some of the Europeans settled there, and Christopher Columbus left a group of people there, not many. Not many, um, uh, Sp um, Spain didn't think highly of, of Jamaica and Trinidad and Barbados. It wasn't, they weren't profitable islands, so to speak, because there was, then they realized there's no gold, but they just kept it temporarily. And, um, but as we move towards the 1500s, And even more towards 1655, there was this, people were thinking, people started learning the importance of sugar and cotton and, and, and developing plantations and so on and so forth. And so the, in Europe, they, they realized that, fine, these countries don't, they don't have gold, but they have something that's just as good as gold. Great land that can give us, where we can do a kind of production to supply the world with sugar. And we can be, the, and if whoever takes control of that, will become the wealthiest. And so the race, the race started. But first of all, of course, the discussion, how do we, where do we get the people to work the land? And of course, they, um, based on research and, um, and, 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 and pioneers that had gone before that actually went to Africa and the reading that they realized, okay, well, let's, Let's take those people from Africa. We're not going to use our people. We're going to use some other people from Africa. But then they have to justify to their people why they are using, they have to go to Africa and enslave these people, bring them, uproot them to the new world. Why was that important? Or oh, sorry, or how do you justify enslaving human beings and treating them the way that you are, you are hoping to treat them? So, of course, and I said to you at the last class, the issue of race is a new concept that started in the 1500s, coinciding with this, with, 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 um, with, start with the transatlantic. And so this brings us into, and this is a very important point I'm about to segue into, because I'm going to segue into the, the, the issue of heritage. Um, the, the issue of heritage. But before I segue into that, the question is, and this is very important. In 1655, Britain um, defeated the Spanish and took over many of the, um, of the, of the islands of the Caribbean that was once owned by the Spanish. Um, and here I'm talking about the English-speaking Caribbean now. Now we're transitioning from Spanish to the English-speaking Caribbean. But what was quite interesting and important, which is I, I, I have to get, and I, you guys have to consider this, is where did the slaves that was in the Caribbean, where did they go? Say, for example, Jamaica. Where, what happened to the slaves that, this, that Spain had? Whatever happened to them? What happened to the, um, did they free them? Yes, they did. They freed them. 
they freed the slaves, but who were uh, were they black? Or were they um, um the indigenous people that were there originally? Because we are told that there was a genocide. Okay, but where did they get people to work the land? Um, we will talk about that when we come back in our next class. In, I'm sorry, not the next class. In this class, we'll take a quick break and we're going to talk about have we misunderstood our heritage? Okay. And um, and it's very important that we have a discussion of, of, of whether or not, um, let me stop sharing my screen, whether or not we have um, misunderstood our heritage because I'm going to share another document. I'm going to share another, uh, where is it? Where is it? Mm -hmm. Okay, no. I'm trying, I'm going to find that. I want to share another document with you. As we get ready, for, I'm going to take a break. It's now 4.34. We're going to take a, uh, a five minutes break. Um, and then we're going to come back and do uh, this other class. Um, this other lecture. But I'm, I'm switching between my windows. Give me one second. There we go. I need this. Let me copy this. Go back to this. Good. Is this the right one? Yes. Control V. There, I'm getting. Rex Nettleford, um, there's something. Okay, here we go. Wow. Are you seeing my screen? Rex Nettleford, um, Rex Nettleford talked about. Rex Nettleford have a, have a paper that looks at national identity and attitude to race in Jamaica and by extension the Caribbean. But Rex Nettleford did an, um, wrote an article that looks at national identity and attitude to race in Jamaica. It's very important. Usually I wouldn't get into this until later on in the class. But since, since we're talking about have we misunderstood our heritage, that speaks to the issue of our roots. And since people such as the urban Indian heritage, um, the urban Indian Heritage Society is now challenging and questioning whether or not black and brown people, whether or not their roots, and in fact, there is a petition that has, that's going around. And they actually have been, they've been doing several studies for it throughout the Caribbean that looks at the Caribbean and their, their roots and their history. We will have them come and do a presentation. Hopefully we can get them next week. I'm hoping to have them next week. That means you have to be on time. In fact, I'm gonna have class at 3.30, just in case, you guys come late. So I'm going to tell them 3.30 so that they, at 3.30, everybody should be in class and ready to go. And it's going to be two persons presenting next week. Um, but it's very important because we are always, we've always talked about Pan-African or being the Caribbean country or Jamaica, Barbados. But Barbados is a little bit different. Barbados is a mixture. Trinidad is a mix. In, it's Indian and, and African. In Jamaica, it's predominantly African. But now we are learning or hearing that, no, what we are told, what we have been told is wrong. Because when, because when you look, when you study the logic and study the history and look what pertains, there is no way, okay, that all the Africans that came, that all the peoples in, 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 in the Caribbean have no relations with the original. What has happened is that there have been a, an attempt to corrupt Caribbean identity, black and brown people's identity or, or root in our heritage, so that those people who have engaged in what we talk about theft, colonialism, theft, can continue to maintain and protect their ill-gotten gain. Okay, heritage and roots is very important. Heritage and roots, very important. Um, recently, we, we thought Israel, Israel became a nation again in 1940, between 1947 and 1948. After World War II, 
The most powerful countries met in 1944. The most powerful country. You know who wasn't that? The, you know who wasn't there in 1944? None of the Caribbean countries, none of the developing countries, none of the colonial countries who are now independent. They they never they weren't there. That's why they had the Bandung Conference in 1955, 1955, where um, where all the nationalists and these countries that were um, colonial countries came together to discuss their independence. But in 1944, the post-industrial, uh, most powerful countries met to create a new world order. Part of that world order was to reestablish Israel as a nation again, so as to, for strategic positioning, for strategic positioning. In, so in 1944, the most powerful countries met, the G8, I mean, uh, France, um, the US, Germany, so on. They met Britain to reorder the world and to discuss starting the IMDB Bank, the WTO Bank, and these world institutions, the United Nations, so on and so forth. The Security Council came up with certain rules. Some people weren't there enough, but only the big countries were there who made the decisions for everyone. So all their interests, so when they met to discuss, of course, they advocated for their own interests because I said to you, we live in a global world, in a, in a what? In a competitive world. In a competitive world. So in 1944, they met after World War II to reorder the world in a particular shape, in their mold, in their eyes. Okay. So that the consequence of this, the consequence of this, by 1947-1948, Israel became a nation again. First of all, in 47, they invaded Palestine or the Middle East. Now, in the Middle East, who was living there? There were some Jews there, but in the Palestine, it wasn't a nation state. It, there were peoples, uh, Palestinian peoples. Palestinian peoples live in Palestine. Not necessarily people who were Jewish or Hebrew, but they were brothers and sisters and they got along. But in, by 1947, the world, by 19, 1944, the, world, the powerful nations met and decided that to ensure and decided that they are going to have strategic position in the world. Part of that strategic positioning in the world was, okay, was also in Palestine, in the Middle East. By 1947, 1948, they invaded Palestine, displacing hundreds of thousands of people, killing hundreds of thousands of people. In other words, they became an occupying force. Just as though, just as though in Europe, they went to parts of Africa, South Africa, yes? Uh, and became occupying force and made an, a nation for themselves called South Africa. And the African people who were there displaced them, created apartheid, and jailed Nelson Mandela, calling him a rebel and a terrorist. You know, okay. Are you guys there? Yes, sir. Good. Calling him a rebel and a terrorist. That is, which, is how, which today they're calling people Hamas, who was the elected leadership of Palestine of the, of the Gaza. They're calling they, um, Israel, did, well, for the, the Israeli government and Netanyahu, he does not approve of Hamas, the elected government. He wanted some other group to be elected, those who are more pro Palestine, pro Israel, pro, pro Hebrew. And so, therefore, there is this antagonism. We've always talked about, anyways. The point I'm getting at here, in 1947, Israel became a nation again. 1948, 1947, they invaded Palestine with guns and machines under the, the auspices of the 1944 agreement. Because it started in 1944, the plan was that by nine, was to maintain a position in the Middle East. And, and just so you know, in the Middle East, they have oil. The oil deposits. Was okay, but of course they said a part 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 of Gaza wasn't Arab land, but they wanted strategic positioning in the region so that they can maintain their control. So what hap what happened, or to prevent another World War II from happening? But what this is what happened when people are reactive. I said to you, in terms of gun control, gun control they want to restrict guns, and once and and to. 
thinking about restricting gun uh, restricting gun policy, having a restricted gun policy in the US, and I said, look to Jamaica. Okay, it's going to create an undergoing economy or black market. When people create things, you have to look at the consequences to that. Okay, so in 1947 or 1948, Israel became a nation again. And since 1948, there has been this, this um, ongoing, the kind of tension, because there, was, there has always been tension between Palestinians and Hebrews, but not, but not at the scale that we're seeing after 1948. But what was the justification for Israel to be, what was the justification that the Israelis provided or the Israelis, Israel and their legal team and their friends um, in the United Nations and so on, who were, who were there at the 1944 meeting? What, what, what justification did they provide in, um, that, uh, in, 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 that, made, that was able to recreate or give them the opportunity to reclaim this land. What was the justification? Because we talk about international rules and laws and so on. The justification is that it was their land to begin with in the first place. In other words, pointing to something historical. The justification is that they lived there before they were Jews, and they lived there before, it was their land, and they're going back to reclaim their land. Okay. And I'm saying, I'm telling, that's the, we're talking about its roots, the importance of having roots and identity. Israel justified, or the Jews, justified their occupation or their re return, okay, or their, their occupation in, 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 in Palestine as a return. As a return, they were reclaiming their land, which was already theirs. Okay, pointing to something, to an identity that was historical. Roots, that's why it's important. But what, but the black man does not have any, okay, in one sense we have roots, but in another sense we don't. Okay, say for example, no, no where, where am I going at? It's, it's important for the Caribbean people to know also think of and the American people to think about their roots. But what has happened is that our roots, our identities have been corrupted. That's according to some people, such as people at the Urban Indian Heritage Society, who are now questioning Arawaks, the, Arican, uh, Arawaks, the Africans, and those um, historians who said that Jamaicans and Caribbean people and um, black and brown and African Americans have no resemblance or no bearing or connection with the original people that existed that existed in the land that the, in the Americas. But now we're hearing of misclassification. Israel was able to point to something to go back to Israel. Now we talk about reparation. We talk about um, reparation. We're talking about reclaim. People in America are now trying to re some. Um, people here who are Indians or whatever, who or have some connection with India, they're trying to reclaim land and so on and so forth. So it is within those people, it is it is within the interest of the post-colonial masters, okay, not to grant any justification or justifiable evidence to people of the, of the Caribbean and black and brown people, any kind of justification that can point them to the, the original people here, because then they can say, well, this is our land in the first place. We are related or directly related to the original people. So, so then they can seek to do what? To make a claim. To make a claim. Say, for example, Haiti right now is making a claim against France because they have to pay France all these billions of dollars in order for their freedom to be recognized. But France is saying that, oh, it's not your country in the first place. They never said this. I'm saying this part. Um, they stole somebody else's land, yes? And then brought new people there. Some of them probably were there before and intermingled. So, I mean, it's their land. However, France's justification is that, well, the, the people who are there, um, they were brought there from somewhere else and, and they took or stole the land from France. It's France. France said it's their land. The Haitians said the Haitians said no. It's it's not. Um, it doesn't belong to them. 
Okay, they were they are fighting for their freedom until they fought off the Brit the French and took over Haiti. But the and so the French required them to pay because France is saying no, it's not yours, it's ours. But but France also moved on to that land and took it from somebody else. But of, okay, but then of course the Haitians could could point to the fact that well we were there before. Or we existed on the land, the island before, or some Caribbean people, or people in the Americas you now as who are now saying that they're Cherokee Indian and so on and so forth. And so in America, they give some of these people land and certain privileges. So now that put that moves me into the to the lecture about national the importance of 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 understanding one's roots, the importance of roots, the importance of identity, the importance of heritage. Okay. Remember how Israel was able to claim or to justify the occupation of somewhere because they point to some roots, some identity, some rates. But but the but when the Caribbean people came here from, from wherever they say we came from, let's say from Africa, or let us say some of us came um, were from part of the original people here. Okay. But whatever the case is, there was an attempt to dilute and to corrupt and to prevent the and to and to disconnect any line any any core that connects the um the uh the the, the the African man or the local to the original. If you saw how they group the Africans or the slaves, mix and mingle. They couldn't read. They weren't supposed to read. They weren't supposed to write. There was an attempt to dilute the intelligence of the African so that he could not reclaim his heritage or his freedom or do any kind of research that would create any discovery about himself. That would then threaten the theft of the colonials. Rex Nettleford on national identity and attitudes to race in Jamaica said the need for roots and the attendant quest for identity are said to be natural to peoples everywhere. Natural to people everywhere. Natural. The need for roots. So when I ask the question, have we misunderstood our heritage? Or the issue of people's heritage being misclassified and the need to reclassify because now there is a petition. There is a petition asking the government of the US or, or and not only that, but we're the, in, the Urban Indian Heritage Society is also going to Jamaica and all of the Caribbean, and they are taking their education all over the world, talking about this misclassification and the need to reclassify us. The need for roots and the attendant quest for identity are said to be natural to peoples everywhere. Now, the phenomenon may be said to inhere in a people's desire to collate and codify their past collective experience, as well as to lay foundations for the realization of future aspirations. So, okay, let me say that again. I mean, he's quite profound here. The real, it's important for us to collate and to codify our past and collective experience, as well as to lay foundations for the, why? Because it's important what, to lay, it's important for the realization of future aspirations. Which the Caribbean is an invention of the 21st century. Who are we going to be for the next future? New nations usually give large portions of their creative, um, creative energy to what may be termed the identity problem. New nations, new nations, of which the Caribbean, we are all new nations in a sense, give large portions of their creative energy to what may be termed the identity problem. And there is the issue of identity is a problem to the Caribbean people. There is the issue of nothing black, no good. That has been ingrained in black and brown peoples. Okay. And that is, say, for example, we talk about changing attitudes towards Afro Caribbean beliefs. And I'm asking you guys to write a proposal and to consider this as part of your final uh, research and final paper talking about changing attitudes towards Afro Caribbean beliefs, changing attitudes towards identity changing attitude towards the attitude comes, but where did the attitudes come from? It comes from something that has been ingrained in us. And so it is important for us to know to question critically 
the issue of identity. Say, for example, the, this, the, the coloration in the Caribbean is not just a Jamaican problem, it's a Haitian problem, it's a Guyanese problem, okay? The issue of browning and the drive to, to using cosmetics to make you look brown. It comes from this worldwide historical understanding, okay, from stemming from colonialism to promote, and I talk about, again, the Negro is not any more than the white man. So new nations usually give large portions of their creative energy to what may be termed as the identity problem. The identity problem for their creative energy to what may be, uh, I'm sorry, um, um, and to what maybe to and, and, and the mid 20th century. Sorry, I apologize. I'm somewhere else. New nations give large portions of their creative energy to what may be termed the identity problem, and the mid 20th century with its flux of emergent countries in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean is particularly rooted or particularly noted for this aspect of um, nation, um, nation building. Now, in Jamaica, a Caribbean country which which attained independence from Great Britain in 1962. The search for identity has been the focus of attention for some time. It is indeed difficult to determine what exactly is meant by the term the Jamaican identity. It is, or by extension, the Caribbean identity. It is variously expressed as things Jamaican or the Jamaican image. Now, the reflection paper for this week, for next week, is to answer the question, okay? Um, um, is to answer the question or or to determine your own heritage, to, to trace your heritage, trace your roots. It is indeed difficult to determine what exactly is meant by the term the Jamaican identity. It is variously expressed as things, Jamaican or the Jamaican image. But what is the Jamaican image? Is it, I said to you when I was in, when I came here for the first time, oh my, I didn't realize my video was, when I came here for the first time, when I came here for the first time to the U.S. in 20, in 2006, first as an exchange student, as part of my study, as, as part of my ministry of formation with the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands, I had to come to the U.S. I lived in Missouri. And people wanted to find out why is it you don't embody the Jamaican image. What's the Jamaican image? My um, dreadlock. Although in Jamaica, at the time, Jamaican uh, dreadlock or the dreadlock or the Rastafarian was seen as a fringe member of society, wasn't part of the status quo, wasn't part of the ac accepted understanding of what passes for um, Jamaican, uh, dignified Jamaican. You know, they were dirty. But yet still, when you come here, the expectation is that you're supposed to be Rasta. <laughs> Such an ambivalent. What an ambivalent. Unless, okay, it's quite interesting. There are, however, ways of approaching the problem. The question, what are we, entails the desire of what we want to be. Oh, Rex Nettleford, amazing. God rest his soul. The question, what are we? entails the desire of what we want to be. What are we entails a desire, a desire. And I said to you in my epilogue of my new book, which is going to be the, the title of a third book I'm writing, reimagining people within critical race theory, not thinking race, but moving away from a hero, from a victim approach to a hero approach. Because I do not believe in race. Race is a is a creation to justify slavery or to create a society in the eyes of those who want to be at the top. The question, what are we, entails the desire of what we want to be. What it is that you want to be. And if what we want to be must have any practical significance for Jamaica, there should be some concordance
there should be some concordance i'm having a headache between the external conception of the island one point at the time it was 1.6 million we have more than that now we have three million people in jamaica and three million people outside of jamaica um and jamaicans okay so let me read that again however ways of approaching the problem the question of what are we entails the, the desire of what we want to be and if we want to be and if what we excuse me and if what we want to be must have any practical significance for jamaica there should be some concordance between the external conception of the island people on the other hand and jamaican's own internal perception own internal perception of themselves as a national entity as a national entity and this is now i just want to um by the way and i'm going to send you a copy of this let me just read briefly because this is quite interesting information in the footnotes i like using footnotes as well rex netherford also used footnotes it's good he says after 307 years a Brit as a British colony, Jamaica gained her independence on the 6th of August, 1962. A strong Jamaican nationalism had shown itself from the 30s, from the 30s, from the 30s, the, the 30s, the 1930s. Again, let me say that again. A strong Jamaican nationalism, talking about what you, what you are and what you want to be, in order to get what you want to be, they thought that nationalism was the best way through a government of socialism. Anyway, a strong Jamaican nationalism had shown itself from the 1930s. That's the same time when Rastafarian was developing. Okay? When labor disturbances and middle class clamor for self-government characterized the political scene. But from the late 40s, there was a significant shift of emphasis to West Indianism. The late 40s, there was a shift, a slight shift of emphasis to West Indianism. Ah, so, okay, so I, I, I stand corrected. In the 1930s, there was this nationalism, yes? Then by the 1940s, there was a shift to West, Indian, West Indianism, which was perfect, which was amazing, okay? which was great we i don't know we needed a west indianism in the plans for a federation of the british west indies which was actually established in 1958 1958 we, there was a brit we had a federation jamaica withdrew in 1961 by referendum from the federation Re um, by a referendum from the refer um, Federation and decided to go it alone. I talk about this a lot, how we decide to go it alone. Since then, the Jamaican image has become a positive goal for different efforts in the country. But I'm going to say this, that was our problem. That is what has affected Jamaican Caribbean, Caribbean prosperity. We decided to go it alone. Some person decided to create a referendum and give it to the people and say, hey, do you think we should have a federation? And the Jamaican people decided, but I think it, we did not provide the kind of education necessary for the people that the people needed to make the decision. Did they talk about ironies? Did they teach them what ironies was? What's an irony? Did they talk about what, did, they, did, we, ex, did we talk about globalization and, and competition and capitalism? Did we talk about that? Did we talk about the fact um, we are small and coming out okay, and therefore it's, 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 it behoves us to, to, in order to have a strong unity to come to discuss, to stay in this federation and slowly go it alone? But anyway, the question of our identity is a very important one. Okay, and when we come back from the break at five, we will take an extended break. Instead of five minutes, I'll give you 10 minutes. So it's now 5.03. When we come back, we are going to begin um, looking at 
is Jamaica um, about our well, we will begin the um, is Jamaica have we misunderstood our heritage? It won't be long. It's just it will be only for fifteen minutes, and then I'm going to give you I'm going to have you guys do a, a a quiz or a poll, which I started last week, but this I'm going to relaunch it this week. So for those that, some of you left without participating in a poll, and I asked the question, what it is that distinguishes between Cuba and Haiti with Jamaica and Barbados and Trinidad. Um, but I think some of you left. Um, so um, I, we, we, we're going to go back to that. But I want to do go into, have we misunderstood our heritage? Present the article uh, um, to you guys, and, and then we go straight into the poll. And if we have time to do the, to do a, to, to answer that question, we will, but we'll begin the lecture next week, um, delving into what differentiates Haiti, Cuba, with the, the rest of the Caribbean. Okay, but for now, um, when we when we come back, we will look at have we misunderstood our heritage? Okay, um, you have. We'll be back at you now five oh five. You come back at five fifteen. All right, guys, welcome back. <clears throat> Excuse me, to the class. Um, just before we go into the lecture, I just wanted to, let me minimize this so uh, I can stay. Yeah, minimize this for a second. Um, I don't know if I had sent this out to you guys, the infamy, um, a list of some currents and reflections in Caribbean currents. Um, I, it's a it's a time a rough draft of a list of Caribbean currents. Um, I start with Arawak to Africans from fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred. Um, the period represents the historical transition in the Caribbean from the indigenous Arawak population to the arrival and enslavement of Africans during European colonization. Um, the Arawak indigenous people were the original inhabitants of the Caribbean islands before the arrival of Europeans, um, with the establishment of European colonies, including the Spanish, English, French, and Dutch, African slaves were brought to the region to work on plantations, leading to significant demographic and cultural changes. Very important, okay? Leading to what? Significant demographic and cultural changes in the Caribbean. That's why we are, we are said that we are an invention. Um, this particular period is marked by inferences from European colonial powers, African culture, cultural heritage, and forced labor system. Um, the philosophy behind um, Arawak to Africa, the book, the work that looks at the 1500s to the 1800s, um, it really combs European colonialism and Eurocentric ideals and research um, to talk about racial hierarchy, plantation, and plantation economies, and how the plant, how plantation economies were set up, and how the plantation economies almost resemble the kind of economies that they were trying to create after slavery and independence. Um, so. <clears throat> We are challenging uh, our work to Africans and what they have said about our heritage. And so I want to spend some time to look, reflect on the question, have we misunderstood our heritage? Um, I want to share that with you. I want to talk about that quickly. To be honest, I want to also talk about the Black position in the world today, but I won't, I won't touch that because I don't think I have time. So I'm just going to go straight into, have we misunderstood our heritage? Um, a very important question that we have to consider for this class. Uh, let me close this. Navigate, let me close this. Okay, so I'm, let me share my screen again. Wait. Oh, new share. Is it this one? I knew. Yes, it is. 
All right, great. Are you guys seeing my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, what do you see? You misunderstood our history. Great, great. Um, question for you guys. Have, have we misunderstood our history? Do you think do you think we have misunderstood our history? That's fine, you don't have to answer. But um, I begin by saying redefining a people so as to misclassify their identity and conceal their heritage is tantamount to genocide. Again, redefining a people so as to misclassify their identity and conceal their heritage is tantamount to genocide. If strategy is employed, so I'm answering the question, have we misunderstood our history? If strategy is employed, and well, if strategy is employed, and, and we talk a little bit about nearly about globalization and strategies, the strategy that has gone into creating the new world, in disrupting Africa to create the new world, and later on, when we start to talk about Walter Rodney and, and look in and delve into his book a little bit, we look at um, how you have underdeveloped Africa. The Caribbean experience is one of the ways that speaks to the underdevelopment of Africa because the best and the brightest were brought to the new world. That has also helped to underdevelop Africa. But if strategy is employed that continues the dynamics today, that had once characterized the transatlantic slave trade, then a re-examination of Jamaica's identity and heritage is warranted, is warranted, specifically in relation to the Taino people who were the original inhabitants of our land. While acknowledging the presence of East Indians, and Chinese. Now, just, just so you know, I, earlier I talked about, we looked at, um, I briefly discussed, I briefly um, showed you the timeline and highlighted our after African from the 15 to the 1800s and saying that the period represents the historical transition in the Caribbean from the indigenous Arawak population to the arrival and enslavement of Africans during the European colonization. And I said that the Arawak indigenous, the Arawak indigenous population were the original inhabitants of the Caribbean islands before the arrival of Europeans. But where are they now? Do we have any Arawaks or any Taino people or ancient Americans or ancient Americans in the Caribbean? Because please remember when we talk about the Americans, ancient Americans were using the word in a general way to talk not only about the mainland but the Caribbean ancient Americans that they not only existed on the mainland but also on in the islands where are they now where are the peoples we 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 have been if you when you read further in our after African they talk about the genocide um, they were wiped out in, in the Caribbean with the establishment of European colonies, including the Spanish, English, French, Dutch, African slaves were. And so and African slaves were brought to replace, to replace the population that was wiped out. We were told that they, some of them committed suicide, it's especially in the case of Arawaks who were in Jamaica. They said that they were... Um, mild-mannered people and they many of them didn't fight back or resist and they committed suicide or they were overworked but of course i'm saying um that's what we are taught we are told and so the, and the slave but and the slaves came to to um came from africa but we are challenged but we are saying that but those, where are those peoples who were in, in uh, the Arawakans? where are they today so i'm going to talk about that in relation to whether or not we have misunderstood our heritage, not in relation to Africa, but in relation to the Arawakans. So, so 
So if strategy is employed that continues the dynamics today, that have capped once, that had once characterized the transatlantic trade, then a re-examination of Jamaica's identity and heritage is warranted, specifically in relation to the Taino people, who were the original inhabitants of the Caribbean. While acknowledging the presence of East Indians and Chinese who arrived during the era or the era of indentured labor, again, while acknowledging the presence of East Indians, because the East Indian came, and the Chinese who arrived during the era of indentured lab labor or servitude after the abolition of slavery in 1865. The majority of the population comprising individuals with black or brown skin is believed to have African ancestry following the eradication of the, Ar the Arawak Indians by the Spanish. The majority of the population in the Caribbean, comprising individuals with black or brown skin, is believed to have African ancestry following the eradication of the Arawak Indians by the Spanish. So the question is, okay, um, that is why I'm giving you the homework, the assignment, to go home and to do a, and to do a, a research, or but not really necessarily, it's not a big elaborate research, just to tracing your history. Investigate, find out whether or not how far back you can go when in tracing your history. How far can you go? So I said that this sets Jamaican apart from other Spanish occupied West Indian islands like Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Belize, and Suriname, which retained a small native Indian population despite the Spanish invasion. Now, Jamaica's history documents the replacement of the native population with African slaves. Again, Jamaica's history documents the, um, the, the replacement of the native population with African slaves brought there or brought to Jamaica by the Spanish. After the English defeated the Spanish in 1655, Jamaica became a significant port for the slave trade and sugar um, exportation. However, there is limited information available, and this is important, regarding the slaves and individuals whom the Spanish had freed following their defeat. I'm, I'm going to say this again. However, there is limited information available regarding the slaves and individuals from the Spanish, uh, uh, individuals whom the Spanish had freed. Because it, when um, when Britain had invaded, invaded Jamaica, um, the Spanish had a small group of slaves that were the locals. Many of them were Amer American Indians. But very is little, but, but there, is limit, there is limited information available regarding the slaves and Indians whom the Spanish had freed following their defeat. It is uncertain whether the small group of people who served the Spanish during their rule were of African or Indian origin. As the extensive trade or Africans to the islands or to the island did not occur before 1655. I'm gonna say this again. This is this is important. It is uncertain whether the small the whether the small group who served the Spanish during their rule were of African or Indian origin. As the extensive trade of Africans to the island did not occur before 1655. The point I'm making here is that, but we are not sure. Very little research is done. And the people who served the Spanish during their rule, were they African? Were they Indians? We are told that in the beginning they were Indian and then later on they all died out. But what? But we are not told how did the African come to, to Jamaica when there was no transatlantic or there wasn't any drive to bring Africans to the Caribbean as yet. So it would stand to reason that 
the people who served the Spanish were, were not Africans, but they were actually Indians. Because, the, because as the extensive trade of Africans to the island did not, sorry, the extensive trade of Africans to the island did not occur, uh, did not occur before 1655. It never happened until 1655. Nonetheless, those who were freed by the Spanish sought refuge in the mountains. Those who were freed by the Spanish sought refuge in the mountains and established what's known as maroon communities. Maroon communities. The people who the Spanish freed just when Britain was invading. And, and those maroon communities persist to this day. And I asked the question, were these the original Indians? Were these the original Indians or do they, or were, were, or, or were they, or were they in any way related to the original Indians? Have we, have we misunderstood our history? And I asked the question, were they, before I continue, were these the original Indians? It's very important that you ask this question because when the Spanish freed, the slaves that they had who went to the mountains and established and became maroons. Then later on, you're going to find that when the British came, eventually took over Jamaica because Brit um, the Spanish did not really protect Jamaica. They didn't see Jamaica at the time as any significant port. So they did not put, if they, if Jamaica could have been a Spanish country to this day, but there was infightings between the locals there and the Spanish or the crown did not see it fit to really invest in Jamaica. But anyway, the Spaniards who were there, they, they, they realized that they couldn't beat the British and they freed their slaves. They went to the mountain, many of whom were Indians. Now, when the, when the British came and they eventually started this, and eventually um, as, slaves, uh, the, as a slave, the slave trade started through the transatlantic, and how the triangular trade started. Many of the slaves who came, who were brought to the island, to Jamaica, we know that many of them also went to the mountains. Many of them also escaped. And, and, um, and some of them intermingled with the Maroons or the, the, the ancient or the indigenous population, many of whom were marooned in the mountains. So it stands. So there is an um a a a. So it stands to reason then, or that it stands to reason then that part of the understanding is that some of the Jamaicans that we have today, or some of the Caribbean people, may have had some biological mix with the indigenous population. Jamaica's identity extends beyond ethnicity, however, and that's important. Jamaica, and not just Jamaica, but the Caribbean. Our identity extend beyond ethnicity. Um, we encompass a diverse range of people united as one, because you know, say for example, Jamaica's motto out of many one people. However, it is undeniable that the majority of our population has a predominant African heritage, and it's not just Jamaica, throughout the Caribbean, um, especially the English people, the British Caribbean, West Indies, the, the British West Indies. It is undeniable that the majority of the population has a predominant African heritage stemming from the era or the era of the slave trade. Now, the Urban Indian Heritage Society is currently challenging this narrative by presenting compelling research and data which suggest that Jamaicans have a rich history which is connected to the native Indians or to the island. Now, they argue that genealogical research reveals an urban American Indian root in Jamaica, an, urban, an, an urban American Indian root in Jamaica, providing an alternative perspective to our historical understanding. Now, I had some, what I did was to, um, the following, well, the following discussions between individuals on the matter is worth exploring as it provides further insight into the historical strategy of corrupting a people or a place through misclassification of their cultures, history, and biology, so as to conceal or protect any gains that are ill-gotten. 
a strategy that involves diluting the purity of a people to prevent any claims that they may have to stolen lands, profits, or gains. That's very important. A strategy. A strategy that involves what? Diluting the purity of a people to prevent any claim that they may have of stolen land, profit, or gain. So this is a small group discussion we are having. Have we misunderstood our history? And I wanted to share that with you. Very important. And then, then you guys can go and have that discussion amongst yourselves. But I wrote in the article to, I wrote the article to, to the Gleaner after I had in, um, interviewed members of the Urban Indian Heritage Society for a show who um, I was having. And um, they're doing groundbreaking research on urban Indian heritage and the misclassification of American families. Now, this includes Jamaicans, and they have been doing work on Jamaican genealogy. They will be coming to, oh, this should not be here. Um, I will be, they're coming to the class to present. But this is what, listen to the discussion. What I did was to copy, um, put the discussions that we had um, in a, in a, in a conversation or in a dialogue. And it's very important that you follow me here. Now, the names are, the only person who has the correct name is me, Reverend Ronaldo. But everybody else, they are pseudonyms, okay? Here, um, so CLI, um, so CL says, is it the Spanish who freed the Maroons? Or the English? Is it the Spanish who freed the Maroons or the English? Then how come their treaty is with the English? How come their treaty is with the English? That's interesting because it's actually the Spanish that freed the Maroons. But then, um, the, please remember that the Maroons, they were freed, but then the Spanish were also, the, the, the English were trying to also take, was trying to um, enslave them. Okay? And they couldn't. So that is why they had, a, a, well, there was a, 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 a treaty with the English, but there was also, there was no treaty with the Spanish, but they were free. They went to the mountains. They freed them. I mean, no treaty is necessary. I don't, I mean, why is a treaty necessary to free a people who are already free? People are inherently free. Yes? But Jamaica is one of the few countries in the, re in the region with little or no trace of the original inhabitants. I wonder if the African slaves also played a part. Just asking somebody that was one one commenter. I responded by saying, were the enslaved Africans or and slaves indigenous? Were the sorry, were the enslaved? Were the enslaved African? Were the enslaved Af were the enslaved? Were they African slaves or were they indigenous? We are told that they were Africans. But is this true? And that the Spanish freed their captives and they fled to the mountains. One person responded by saying the majority of the original inhabitants were killed by the Europeans, majority, um, physically and by diseases. Others um, interbred with African slaves. Very important. You don't really read that part as when you read Caribbean history. The Maroons ran away into the interior of the land. The treaty was with the English because they were the last enslavers of Jamaican slaves. Um, read Las Casas' account of how the murder, the murder of Columbus disseminated the indigenous peoples and African slaves in Jamaica and Santo Domingo before the British, for which he was jailed twice. He was not afraid to write in his diaries that his fellow murderers fed the Taino babies to his dogs because the meat was tender. One gentleman said it should be noted that the actions of Columbus and subsequent con uh, conquistadors that followed in subsequent decades were not condoned by the Spanish government. In fact, Columbus would say to you that Columbus would not, that, and Columbus does not, there is nowhere where you, in Columbus is writing where you find where he said that a, a plan was done to kill off the Arawaks. The Spanish monarchy, as well as the Pope, were appalled after hearing of the brutal treatment meted out to the native Indians 
and many times sent authorities to arrest them because of the long distances and length of time required to reach the Americas, the arrest warrants were practically useless as the envoys of the Spanish crown were easily corrupted by the vast amount of gold and silver to be acquired in the colonies. News of the brutal treatment of native Indians caused outrage all over Europe, with many European monarchs deciding never to follow in the Spanish example and established colonies in the Americas, example, the Hamburgs, as well as the various German princes. Um, many vowed never, but just so you know, that is why prior, as, we, as, we, as, as they embarked on slaves from Africa, the justification was used to say, these used to just, the justification was used to defend their treatment of slaves. Calling the, the Arawaks, sorry, calling the people from South Africa, sorry, from Africa, calling them savages because of the unpopularity of the treatment of the, um, of the people in the Americas. Now, one of the gentlemen said, it has always been said that the Maroons have high cheekbones and thick, long, black hair. The Maroons. They, uh, the Maroons have high cheekbones and thick, long, long black hair. This is because the, um, the Africans who fled to the hills to escape slavery encountered Tainos, Awak, with whom they interbred. This accounted for the distinctive features of early Maroons. But I believe their genetic imprint has become increasingly watered down with the passage of time. I believe you are right. The Tainos, the Arawaks, were not all killed off by the Spaniards. A remnant of them escaped to the hills. And when the Blacks escaped to the hills also, they eventually diluted and overwhelmed the Indian population through interbreeding. But interbreeding does not discount any connection because you know if you were to do genealogical studies, genealogical studies, it would suggest you can trace the blood type, you can trace the connection. So the connection is still there, even though it's been diluted by, over, by interbreeding. Um, the UIHS will be presenting, okay, forget, oh, sorry about that. Um, let's go to the next one. No need to wonder or speculate. A DNA ancestry test will reveal all. I took one a few years ago, and I, in fact, I asked for my students in the last class to do a to do um to do an, an ancestry study or and one person went as far as to order a DNA ancestry test. And um it was quite fun. And I'm gonna ask you guys to do that for next week to come ready to, to talk about it. And we're gonna have the um the UIHS. They will be here next week. I took one a few years ago and it revealed African, which involved Nigerian, Sierra Leone, North African, um, Asian, which involves Chinese and Vietnamese. And European, Scottish, Latvian, and Lithuanian ancestry, but not a trace of indigenous Taino DNA. Of course, I don't think they have any trace of the Taino people. And and then okay, they don't. And I'm going to respond to that question. According to their report summary, my DNA results are typical and representative of most Jamaicans. Most Jamaicans. And in fact, that is the philosophy behind the ancestry test. You go and order an, an, an ancestry test from ancestry.com. What is their philosophy? Okay, what is it that informed their philosophy? Did they draw blood or from or samples from or sorry or do the, or have DNA match DNA put down? Do they have DNA from those people who are or which are? related to the to to the Arawakan? No, they do not. That's too much work for them. A few weeks later, and um, a few weeks later, and we'll know exactly where on the globe the Maroons came from, down, down to the very village. Um, I responded by saying, have you wondered why that is so? No trace of indigenous ancestry? Have you asked about their methods and methodology and philosophy? 
What is the method? What is what is their methodology in doing this ancestry or the genealogical test? Why they could not, they would not present any kind of nowhere, no Jamaica. I mean, you haven't heard if you ask every Jamaican to do an ancestry, you won't hear any trace to any Taino people. In fact, they are limited by what they have and what they can tell you. They can only tell you what they know. They cannot tell you what they don't know, what they don't have. Which stems from a philosophy that says all those people were wiped out. So, of course, their method does not include those people because they're wiped out. So there's no way Jamaicans and Caribbean and black people can be related to those people. And that's so you have to ask yourself those studies. That's critical thinking. Who are the people who conduct the research? Who are they? That's the next question. Further, did they match it against any indigenous people? And do they have DNA samples of indigenous people for them to conduct proper matching or to do the to do the uh, or do they use generalizations? Now, one person responded by saying that DNA ancestry analysis is based on the work of scientists that have collected DNA samples of every human population spread across the globe that's what they say okay um the the work of collecting all this dna and the statistical analysis took decades but has resulted in a, by decades how long are we talking about 10 30 years or 200 years it doesn't go back to 200 years trust me okay the work of collecting all this dna and 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 the and by the way recently there was a there was some there was news that um, uh, genealogical tests. So, so there was a ge uh, genealogy.com or ANSYS. There was a study that was being questioned and in terms of their methodology and how scientific it is. And, uh, and UIHS have created their own, our own. Of, uh, we talk about history from below, writing your own history. A journey in the past requires that you tell your own story, okay? And you have to be very mindful of the strategy that has gone on historically, to dilute and corrupt your own history, preventing any connection to the past that can disrupt and create any claim against those persons who have stolen wealth and now are living off the land. But according to this gentleman, these DNA databases are so accurate, which, and I'm going to say they are not so accurate, but according to him, they are so accurate that even police authorities in that uh, even police authorities, the world, um, even that even police authorities, the world over, are using them to solve crimes. Using a DNA to solve crime have nothing to do with understanding your history as it relates to your DNA and your connection to the past, your connection to the Taino people. That has nothing to do with it. It's absolutely ridiculous and nonsensical. Um. I, 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 after doing my DNA ancestry analysis, the results reveal that I have second and third cousins all over the UK and the US, relatives I've never heard of before in my life. And all of this made possible by comparing the percentage of common DNA we share with each other. We share with each other. But what of the uncommon DNA? Um, let's, Beverly Brown Sands, PhD, said the Maroons who live off the coast of the Caribbean in the USA, where they originally from Jamaica, the Maroons who lived off the coast, so they're off the Carolinas in the USA, were they originally from Jamaica? And I said, that is interesting. What is documented and told to us is that after the Spanish free, after the Spanish freed their captains during the invasion of the British and the subsequent defeat, those whom they had freed went to the mountains and, and others went elsewhere, such as the southern coast of the US, which was part of the Carolinas. Now, critical race theory now asserts and is uncovering records of the connection between the slaves in the North and those from the Caribbean, and that were um, that were active um, and that they were active travel between the North, the Caribbean, and 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 and, and the U and the Americas. But were the Jamaican Maroons actually urban Indians? The, uh, Dalbert Hall says it was the Spanish and Portuguese who first started using Africans as slaves. The Spanish and the Portuguese. The English continued the tradition when they took over in 1655. So the Spanish and the Portuguese were using slaves. But as, as, as again, of course, we know that. 
where they were using African, I mean, started using the Portuguese, they were the first ones to start using African, Spanish and Portuguese started using African slaves first. But as again, not to the degree that we have after 1655. Now, the Spanish, Italian, and the Portuguese started using slaves, we started slavery in 1492. But where did they get these slaves from? From Africa? That is an assertion that we are making. Where did they get the, the, the African slaves from? Now, it was the Portuguese that started the transatlantic slavery first. It was the Portuguese that started the transatlantic slavery first. Portuguese were going to Russia for slaves, but the Russians learned the language, ran away, and blend in. Again, the Portuguese were going to Russia for slaves, but the Russians learned the language, ran away, and blend in. Now, the Africans could not blend in, even if the language was learned. Africans could not blend in, even if the language was learned. So yes, the Portuguese, the Italian, they started slaves, but they, were get, they weren't getting slaves from Africa. We talk about they started using the, the slaves that they were using were probably the, the, sorry not probably the slaves came from Russia and other parts they were ex, they experimented with other slaves to a less degree um, Africans but the African Africans and black people weren't considered less than in fourteen in fourteen ninety two the African the black people they weren't considered savages in a sense until we started the slave trade by, okay and the, the, the transatlantic in the 1600s okay 15 going to the 1600s that's very important to note now russians russians according to globe trotter russians running away and learning the language huh the the uh the uh, the uh, the Caucasian region nowadays comprising part of Georgia, the Caucasus region com nowadays comprising part of Georgia, Azerbaijan, etc., was historically a favorite location for sourcing slaves, especially by the Arabs and the Ottomans, present day North Africa and Turkey. So many, okay, many of them from North Africa and Turkey who placed a high value on white Christian slave woman. So the slave was, at one point, was white and Christian and slave, a woman. Millions were, were, were um, carried away into slavery over a period of four to five hundred years. Now, this puts the, 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 um, the transatlantic trade into perspective. Okay? Until the region was conquered and came under Russian rule in the 19th century, yeah. under, under, under whose sphere of influence they remain to this day. So all those subjugated, being subjects of the Russian Empire, had some privileges such as protection from Arab slave traders. And this is why slavery came to an abrupt end in the, in the, in, um, in the Caucasus, in, or in Russia, as you call it, but more specifically, southern Russia. Not because anyone ran away and blend in, but because they fell under the protection of the Russian Empire, who had the mil who had the military will and means to defend its subjects from slave raiders. Okay, and so therefore, and th and so then you find the move. Now, to try with a different kind of slave, but first to justify the type of slavery. Okay. So it's quite important and it's quite interesting the conversation. I'm going to stop here because we're running out of time. We only have four minutes. Um, I'm going to stop here, but this is quite interesting. Any questions so far, guys? As we wrap up, we're about to wrap up now because we only have four minutes left for the class. Um, we will. This is quite interesting, but um, if you do have any questions, that's great. 
because I want to move, I want to spend the next, the last four minutes, sorry, the last four minutes, we only have five people in the class. Um, I know Alice has said that she needed, she can't stay, but there's one other student that came and left. Um, who is that? Somebody um, left the class. I'm not sure who it was. Um, but anyway, let's, let's wrap up with, uh, I'm going to have you watch, but for the last five minutes, a brief video, okay? A brief video, and we'll end there. Um, hold on a second. Let me bring it up real quickly. Any questions so far, guys? Not at this point, sir. All right. Good, good. Now, this is a... Uh, oh, no. Is this the one I wanted you guys to watch? Nah, this is it. This is it. This is for 13 minutes. And um, and as soon, and when this finish, um, we, we end class. Okay? But um, this video is for 13 minutes. I'm going to share my screen with you so you have it. So let me go here. Share screen. Is this it? Ah, here we go. Bop. Share. Bop. Oh, oops. Let me share sound. Share sound. Great. An introduction to CLR James and the Black Jacobins. Very good book. Our James book, The Black Jacobins, Toussaint Louverture, and the Saint-Domingue Revolution. I'm D. Elizabeth Glasgow, and I'm your lecturer for this series. CLR James' book, The Black Jacobins, is a powerful and definitive history of one of the most important but under-recognized events in history, the Slave Revolution that took place in Haiti from 1791 until 1803. The book is important not only as a historical account of the event, but as one of the very first examples of history told from the point of view of the oppressed population, in this case the slaves of the island. Um, James it, was a It's told from the point of view of the oppressed population the people living on the island. That is the subaltern view. That is history from below, okay? Good. Politically engaged journalist from Trinidad. And he spent considerable time in the book discussing the truly awful conditions of slavery in Saint-Domingue, as Haiti was then called. He looked at before the revolution and the remarkable leadership qualities of the slave turned revolutionary Toussaint Louverture. James' outlook in the book was very much influenced by Marxist philosophy, and this is what set the book apart from other accounts by other scholars of the Haitian Revolution. James wrote, The revolt is the only successful slave revolt in history, and the odds it had to overcome. I, that's very, you know, I know it's 13 minutes. This is very important, guys. Very important. Okay. To Saint Sailor James's account of what happened in Haiti and the Haitian Revolution is different, okay, from all the other accounts that we've had. Because the other account was told from a top-down approach. It wasn't from the subaltern. It wasn't told by the very people who were, who the history affected, who, who were affected by the very history. And it was told in a certain way, in a different kind of a way. But now it's being told by C.L.R. James, who is in a kind of a Marxist bent, but quite very important, very important. Is evidence of the magnitude of the interest. James wrote, the revolt is the only successful part from other accounts influenced by Marxist philosophy, and this is what set the book apart from other accounts by other scholars of the Haitian Revolution. James wrote, The revolt is the only successful slave revolt in history, and the odds it had to overcome is evidence of the magnitude of the interests that were involved. Beyond the bottom-up history,
that is, history told from the perspective of the marginalized rather than those of the elite status or politically influential members of society, readers of the Black Jacobins will gain a greater understanding of the political dynamics of the late 18th century. Now this includes not only the events in Saint-Domingue, but the influence of the revolutions that took place in both America and France, and the key role that slavery played in these politics. When you're looking at a book like The Black Jacobin, you will be able to gain a fuller appreciation of the truly barbaric practice and the nature of the economies that were built from that practice of slavery. Now, the book is a radical work, and so it will appeal to readers who lean towards revolutionary politics, but it is also a work that is very engaging to a wider audience. So let's look at the work in the context of how it was written. The book, The Black Jacobins, is an example of what is called history from below. Now, although the term itself denotes works of history told from the perspective of people of low social and economic status, it was only used by historians long after The Black Jacobins was published in 1938. James' book was one of several works that inspired the field of subaltern or post-colonial studies. Here, historians from the branches of social inquiry which deal with the various legacies of the colonial period, write history from the point of view of the subalterns, the subalterns being those groups that have been excluded from traditional power structures and opportunities, like slaves and peasants. James's approach to history, and indeed the whole of the subaltern school, cannot be understood without appreciating the works of Karl Marx, whose idea of history was shaped by the German philosopher Hegel's notion of the dialectic, a word that denotes the tension created between an idea or concept and the reactions that rise up in opposition to it. This antithesis eventually leads to a kind of synthesis, a fusion of the two ideas. Karl Marx built on this idea of the dialectic to develop his notion of historical materialism, where history is pushed forward by economic forces. The word materialism here should not be confused with its contemporary meaning, which is a focus on material possessions. Rather, Marx believed that the driving force of history was how the means of production, or the tools and resources used to produce goods and services, how those are owned and organized in any society. For example, in a capitalist society, most economic activity is in private hands, and businesses act in a way that promotes the profits and interests of their owners. As Marx wrote in the German Ideology, this mode of production must not be considered simply as being the production of the physical existence of the individuals. Rather, it is a definite form of activity of these individuals, a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life on their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. He went on to write, We're almost um, wrapping up. Um, we, we, finish, we won't go beyond 6.15. Um, what I'll do is we'll pick up with this video um, in, what time is it now? Because it's 6.05. We started a bit late, so I... And, and it's a very good video because I wanted to make a point about this very important point. You guys can interact with it in your interaction papers if you want. But this is important because we talk about production. And Marx look look at the production. When you look at a society, when you study society, you ask the question in whose interest. And when you study the society, you can study the production how the society is arranged. How how the society is arranged around it's production who produces what and who is not producing what okay what are the gains of the production um when you look at when you compare the global north and the global south or the caribbean as again we talk about in the global south in jamaica okay in jamaica or the global south um the jamaica or the global south the the production their specialization in the global north is more 
but it's more around the raw material. Say, for example, let's look at bauxite. Okay, we are more we 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 focus the Caribbean, Jamaica, but focus on 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 extracting the bauxite. Okay extracting the raw material and then we send it to the global north for them to refine it and to fit and for the finishing it and then they sell it back to us for um, how much money do we get do we get from the raw material first of all we don't have the technology to turn the aluminium i mean the, the bauxite into aluminium and the minerals to fight the finish one okay and two and we don't have the capital and we were not developed and we, we weren't developed in a way to develop our our capacity to be able to do that. So now we still have to, we, although we have bauxite, in terms of the production process, we are more, we, our focus is more on the, the raw material. Talk about specialization and the raw material. The input as against output. What, what in the Caribbean, when you look at the Caribbean or compare society, then you look at the production process. Okay. Are we at the final stage of production or the early stage? No. Majority of the Caribbean countries or the post-industrial countries, they are more on the, the first stages. And, and not only that, that was the idea in recreating the new world, in recreating the Caribbean after the six, after independence and so on, making the, in, and in terms of globalization, the Caribbean and the black and brown countries were supposed to be doing, were supposed to be the workers. They, okay, when you look at the production cycle or the stages of production, the stages of production, the stage of production that the Caribbean should occupy is at the beginning, the first stage, okay? The, the, the raw material, ex or, sorry, or, or extracting the, the bauxite, and then we send it to the mother country or to the global cell to do the finish because they have the know-how. We don't have the know-how. We don't have the intelligence, okay? They have the intelligence. They have the capability. Um, in terms of, if you look at the production, so... The production of ours is the fact that most most of our economic arrangement borders or uh, focuses on the raw material, the early stage. That also affects our gain and our wealth and our earnings. Those who focus, those countries and peoples who are more focused on the the last or the end or the output or the the last stage of production, society determines that they get more money, they are paid more, okay, they benefit more than those who are at the first stage. Who are, who are those at the first stage? The Caribbean or the black and brown nations. When you start to look at the production, a whole production happening in societies and where people are in terms of the stages, and it will give you an understanding of, of the gains that some people have and the gains that some people don't have, okay, when you start to study society. Anyways, let's wrap up this real quickly because I'm going to stop at 6.15 and then we'll pick up where we left off. Okay? Like in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all dead generals weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. So, in other words, Marx believed that individuals tended to see the world according to their role within the means of production, as business owners, for example, or as wage earners. The interests of those often competing groups is what drives history, according to Marx. Antonio Gramsci extended Marx's theory to the discussion of culture, and in doing so, laid the groundwork for subaltern history, or history from below. Put simply, Gramsci developed a theory of cultural hegemony, stating that the dominant social class, for example the bourgeoisie or the business owners, not only had a big influence over the economy, but they had a big influence over a society's culture as well. Gramsci believed that the creation of an alternative or proletarian culture, that is a culture of the workers, promoting revolutionary ideas, that these were necessary for the overthrow of capitalism and the rise of the communist state. So to some extent, this is also the goal of subaltern studies, of which the Black Jacobins plays a very early part. Subaltern studies represent the history of groups excluded from the dominant culture. While James was strongly influenced by a Marxist approach to history, 
The Black Jacobins is not rooted in any particular academic school or debate. Rather, it emerged from the tense political environment of the late 1930s. C.L.R. James was a keen observer of both political events and cultural developments, and there is some evidence that the author was inspired by his immediate surroundings in London while he was writing The Black Jacobins. In The Black Jacobins, C.L.R. James asked a central question. How did a group of uneducated slaves in what is today Haiti successfully overthrow their colonial masters and defeat the invasions that followed from France, from Britain, and from Spain? As the only successful slave revolt in history, the events in Saint-Domingue warrant attention. As an historian, James aim is to describe the slave revolt from the point of view of the revolutionaries and their leader, Toussaint Louverture. Throughout James's historical investigations, he is asking another question as well. What is the nature of revolution, and what are the conditions in which the proletariat, or the workers, can overthrow those responsible for their oppression? Although James does not explicitly frame his discussion in these terms, his political viewpoint informs his discussion of history. James's Marxist beliefs also placed the book squarely in the heart of the political conflicts of the late 1930s. As he writes, the violent conflicts of our age enable our practiced vision to see into the very bones of previous revolutions more easily than heretofore. He refers to the violent upheavals going on across Europe at the time, the eve of World War II. He notes the revolts held by the fascist leader in Spain, when he writes of Franco's heavy artillery, and refers to the mass repression in the Soviet Union, when he writes of the rattle of Stalin's firing squads. Such is our age, and this book is of it, with something of the fever, then, and the fret. He writes in the Black Jacobins, The writer has sought not only to analyze, but to demonstrate in their movement the economic forces of the age, their molding of society and politics, of men in the mass and individual men, the powerful reaction of these on their environment at one of those rare moments when society is at boiling point and therefore fluid. As a work of history, the Black Jacobins builds upon previous works on the revolution in Saint-Domingue and the conditions there more generally, much of it published in French. These works include scholarly histories, first-person accounts, official archives, and travel books. James provides an annotated bibliography of these works in the book, in which he writes, Despite the importance and interest of the subject, it was for long difficult to find in English or French a comprehensive treatment of the Saint-Domingue Revolution. Both in insight and objectivity, the Haitian writers are easily the best. James draws on a long list of sources, notably Colonel Henri de Poyon Belize and his history of 1899, Histoire militaire de la Révolution de Saint-Domingue, or A Military History of the Revolution of San Domingo. James writes of this book, This is the official French account. Poyon misunderstands the whole campaign both the offensive plan of Leclerc and the defensive plan of Toussaint. There is no limit to the brazenness of these imperialist historians. Despite disagreeing with Pion's version of history, James finds the historian to be a careful scholarly writer and is able to build on Pion's work. This is a theme in James's work. Though he frequently disagrees with the work of scholars who went before him, he finds that he can use their work in his own. In an important way, James's history of the Haitian Revolution builds on the work of the scholars of another revolt that started barely two years earlier, the French Revolution. As he notes in the Black Jacobins, it is impossible to understand the Saint-Domingue Revolution unless it is studied in close relationship with the Revolution in France. Fortunately, the French Historical School of the French Revolution is one of the greatest historical schools of Western civilization. 
James lists in the book several French historians who inspired his own study of the Haitian Revolution. They exposed the economic foundations of the French Revolution. They wrote about the personalities of the main actors and covered the politics of the period. James credits these influences in the book on the Haitian Revolution. I have sought all through to show the direct influence of the French Revolution on events and leading personalities in Saint-Domingue. It appears from James's biography that the awareness of an interest in this history was sparked when he moved to Europe in the 1930s. In that sense, the intellectual basis of the work is James's attempt to unify his understanding of West Indian culture, that is the culture of the islands of the Caribbean Sea, and history with the debates over history and politics going on at the time in England and France. So in other words, James was very much influenced by historians of the French Revolution when he wrote The Black Jacobins. This is D. Elizabeth Glasgow. Caribbean history and DNA. Caribbean history and DNA. In 1492 CE, Christopher Columbus sailed across the Atlantic and landed in the Americas. He and his men were the first to wash up in the Bahamas, Hispaniola, Dominican Republic, and Haiti, and Eastern Cuba. From Europe. To do from Europe. They were the first to do so but they weren't the first to um, to wash up there not the first but however on their re return to to spain he and his brother bartholomew later returned to the americas and identified hispaniola's land and indigenous people as potentially profitable for the spanish crown bartholomew estimated about 1.1 million people lived on hispaniola but modern scholars have generally used the range of 250,000 to a million people. However, the actual Caribbean Aboriginal population is now known based on a new Caribbean DNA study published in the journal Nature, which fuses decades of archaeological work with cutting-edge genetic technology. And this breakthrough study shows that the local population before the arrival of the Spanish was much lower and far less heterogeneous than thought. That is from critical thinking. Caribbean DNA study challenges Spanish, um, Spanish assumptions. Professor David Reich of, um, of the Harvard Medical School led a team of researchers who analyzed the genomes of 263 individuals representing the largest ever study of ancient human DNA in the Americas. The Caribbean DNA study concluded that the Caribbean had been settled by two major migratory waves of highly mobile people separated by thousands of years. However, according to an article by the Florida Museum of Natural History on their way to this conclusion, the researchers develop a new genetic technique for estimating the island's past population size prior to the first Spanish landings. This is quite important. Now, when the first Europeans arrived, the number of people living in the Caribbean was far smaller than 1.1 million, reported by, by Columbus's brother Bartholomew, Professor of Archaeology William Keegan from the Florida Museum of Natural History, um, was co-senior author of the new study, and he told the New York Times that this study of ancient DNA moves, moves the academic understanding of the Caribbean's history forward dramatically in one fell swoop two ancient waves of caribbean dna the new genetic evidence offers um, insights into the early people of the caribbean and suggests that the island's first inhabitants were a group of stone tool users who had boated to Cuba about 6,000 years ago. Now these first inhabitants expanded eastward and populated other smaller islands during the region's archaic age. 
the study determined that they had closer genetic links with people from Central and South America compared to the ancient DNA from North America, North American Indian cultures and further cementing this origins story. Now artifacts found in Belize and Cuba also suggest they had a Central American origin. The second ancient pathway into the Caribbean was forged 2005 2,500 to 3,000 years ago by groups of migrating farmers. The paper says these people were related to the Arawak speakers of Northeast or South America who had paddled the fingers of South America's Oricono River basin from the interior to coastal Venezuela then northward into the Caribbean Sea. After settling on Puerto Rico, these explorers traveled westward beginning the region's ceramic age which is defined by these farmers agricultural methods and style of pottery now the new caribbean dna study also relied on ceramic ceramic evidence before this new study was published there had always been unclarity regarding the various styles of pottery discovered in the caribbean each of which was associated with later migration waves However, the newly gained genetic information finally determines that all the fragments of ancient pottery found in the region were created by one group of people over time. Another aspect of the study analyzed the X chromosomes from 19 pairs of genetic cousins who had all lived on different islands but were separated by several generations. For example, the, the DNA from a man buried in the Bahamas was matched with another man discovered 600 miles away in the Dominican Republic, according to the paper. Dr. Reich wrote, Dr. Reich wrote that there's such a finding. By the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause right there to suggest this. It is not difficult. Uh, it is. They didn't have the ease of mobility. They never had the ease of mobility. The, I, the people in the islands at the time, these people, they never had the ease of mobility. So yes, you can find that one man was related to another person 600 years. But it shows how the travel was active. And I said that in the last class, the people of the Caribbean, they were actively traveling. And many of these, and they washed upon the islands. These, and by the way, the, the, this, it, the, the narrative begins by saying that people... Christopher Columbus were the first people to have washed up on the islands but then later on talk about other people who mobile people who were washed up on the island who came and who, mobile farmers who came and traveled all along the island so that that's a con that's a contradiction right there okay but it that but it is quite interesting as we talk as we as we talk about um, the importance of 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 rethinking our heritage and studying our heritage and our roots and questioning whether or not we have misunderstood our heritage and we're having here and how, now we're hearing that what we thought about the spanish dna is 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 is, is completely different they now now new studies is the in researchers are finding some different evidence that suggesting something different and something something new as it re relates to how the people of the cabin were closely connected although they were separate but they were and they were they were very diverse and mixed and there was lots of intermin intermingling that that has always defined the carrot the americas by the way you can watch this video is available it's called caribbean origins history migrations and dna i won't um share uh, read any more of this but it is available um in in um on youtube and you notice these people's help I mean, so you can you guys can um catch um, can watch that i'll stop right here